Hello, and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And this video is going to be the first of two on the prologue of Joe Abercrombie's The Blade Itself, the first book of the First Law Trilogy. And I'm, I'm splitting it up into two because not only is there, there quite a bit of text here to work through, but also the, there's some really interesting stuff about writing, the rules of writing, and, you know, making sure that you follow the rules and Abercrombie breaks some of those rules and it's actually really interesting how he does it why he does it and the effect that he creates by doing this um, and what it always reminds me of is there used to be this English uh, comedian who was a brilliant pianist and he had a party piece a skit that he always did where he would take a very famous piece of music and he would start playing it and would deliberately play wrong notes. And a musician, another musician, a pianist might say, well, that's not how you play. Uh, you are doing it wrong. But because he knew what notes to play incorrectly, he was creating a comedic effect. And it wasn't that he just was randomly picking notes. He, he always knew which ones to break to create the effect. And I think uh, the opening of the blade itself is one of those prologues that if you were doing a very superficial analysis or um, a sort of standard, you know, these are the rules of writing, you would look at this and you could criticize a whole lot of the choices that Abercrombie makes. And I think you'd be missing the point about what he is actually doing, like how he is creating these things and the effects that he creates. And I think it is a brilliant opening prologue. So uh, I'm going to go through uh, this in two videos. And this first one is, is just looking at it. I have three slides of text and we'll, we'll work through that. And then the second video is going to focus more on the narrative conclusion and, and how Abercrombie plays with that. So the thing I actually forgot to put on the slide is that the prologue is called The End. And this is, this is one of those really fun things because what does it mean by the end being at the very beginning of the book? And we get into that old thing that the, the end of one thing is the beginning of another thing. So it's signaling this is, uh, or well, potentially signaling, I should say that this event marks the end of one chapter of um, what is happening to open up a new story. So it's a way of signaling uh, in media res, of implying a previous history. And it's actually just the end, two words to imply a history to what's going on. And I actually think that's quite clever. That's quite nice. So let's have a look at these first three paragraphs. Logan plunged through the trees, bare feet slipping and sliding on the wet earth, the slush, the wet pine needles, breath rasping in his chest, blood thumping in his head. The opening sentence, it's a run-on sentence. Uh, it has all of these subclauses. From a technical writing standpoint, no, no, you know, you don't, you, you've done too much in this one sentence. And yet what we have here, this is action. We're given the name of a character. We're given the action plunging through the trees, this headlong rush. And what we have is the structure of the sentence is actually managing to convey that breathless pace, lots of action happening in this one sentence. And we have very dynamic, interesting description being used. So plunged through the trees, giving us that sense of hurtling. We're also given trees. So we know foresty kind of thing which is then backed up by wet pine needles. So we have an idea of the type of forest it is. So in our heads, we're picturing some person called Logan running through a forest. Bare feet slipping and sliding on the wet earth, the slush. And this is again, brilliant, concise, consolidated description. Bare feet slipping. So someone is running through the trees in their bare feet implying they weren't ready. This was not planned. They're in a headlong rush. 
they're not wearing shoes, boots, socks, anything on their feet. So all of this is being conveyed, conveyed with bare feet and then slipping and sliding on the wet earth, the slush. So wet earth, okay, so we know it's going to be uncomfortable, it's squidgy, it's, it's muddy, but the slush, slush is then conveying a sense of coldness. Um, so we would, in this world, you know, we're now thinking pine needles, sort of snowy, melting slush, high altitude, where you would have the, the snow and these sorts of on mountains, or um, somewhere northern that's going to be cold. Breath rasping in his chest. So Logan is male because breath rasping in his chest, but rasping, again, this glorious sort of description of labored breathing, that this is panicked. This is not, he's going for a gentle morning jog. All of this conveyed so quickly, so concisely. Blood thumping in his head. So this pounding in his head. So everything here works so well as an opening sentence. Uh, the action, the panic, because blood thumping in the head, it's not his chest thumping. It's that pounding in your head of exertion. So there's panic here. There's exertion, all contained in this. He stumbled and sprawled onto his side, nearly cut his chest open with his own axe, lay there panting, peering through the shadowy forest. So we get a consolidation of where we are. It is a shadowy forest. So it's forest. It's not bright daylight. So we could be thinking either early dawn, um, dusk, any sort of time where we have a blending of light. It's not full daylight, but it's not full dark. It's shadowy. And that's implied in th just those two words. Peering through. So he's fallen down and he's looking up and peering. So intensely focused on trying to find something. Um, but stumbled and sprawled onto his side. You know, you could note the sibilance. Uh, I don't think it's particularly relevant, but there's a nice stumbled and sprawled. So he stumbled and then fell. But we get a sense of that ungainliness of uh, this is undignified. He sprawled. He's, he didn't tuck and roll and come up in a fighting pose. Nah, he's, he's flat on his ass. Uh, sprawled onto his side. So he's lying there in an ungainly, ungainly pose nearly cut his chest open with his own axe. So now we know male character called Logan carrying an axe. So not a, a noble long sword, anything like this. So there is a slight hint and connotation, uh, particularly within fantasy writing. The axe is a barbaric weapon. It's not a noble weapon. And all of that is done in two sentences in the opening paragraph. And you just go, that's, I think that's a brilliant way to open a story. The dog man had been with him up until a moment before. He was sure, but there wasn't any sign of him now. As for the others, there was no telling. Some leader getting split up from his boys like that. So the dog man. Logan, name. Dog man, um, name, race. We don't know but it's slightly unusual. So again, it's setting us up. This is a fantasy novel. It's one of these elements of the, the uh, fantastic creeping in. This could be a race. It could be a person. It could be a title, but the dog man. So it, it seems important. And this is going to be one of those, I think uh, an expression used all the time now is read and find out. So it's a, a, mo a little bit of intrigue to pique your interest, to go, Ooh, I wonder what's going to happen. Who is this? What's going on? The dog man had been with him until a moment before. So we, this dog man had been accompanying him because it's had been with him, not chasing him, not pursuing him, nothing like that. And we know he was running headlong through these trees. So there's a sense that the dog man is a companion. Um, and he was sure. So we have this reassurance to himself. I, I was absolutely positive I had done that, which means you doubt yourself. So we get a sense of the main character's confusion, discombobulation, the fact that 
a lot of things have happened very quickly and he's not 100% sure. So even though he says he was sure, this is telling you that he wasn't sure. But there wasn't any sign of him now. So we now know that Logan is on his own. It's confirming what we thought from the, the opening. As for the others, there was no telling. So it's not just Logan and the Dogman, there are others. Some leader getting split up from his boys like that. So the perspective is with Logan. He was accompanied by Dogman. Some leader getting split up from his boys like that. There's an implication that Logan is the leader. And these were people who were following him, accompanying him. We also get a sense that they are male, his boys. And because he refers to them as his boys, we get a sense that he's the leader, there's a hierarchy, and because he refers to them in that diminutive, that informal, they're boys. And unless he's like um, Peter Pan and the Lost Boys, they're not actually going to be children. But we don't know, it's not confirmed. But it seems that one of them is called the Dogman. But we're not 100% sure. So again, it's this giving you a little fragment to uh, get you to buy into this narrative and encourage you to read on. It's not spelling everything out straight away. He should have been trying to get back, but the Shanka were all around. So here we have this next element of the sort of the fantasy writing keeping uh, creeping in, the Shanka. What is a Shanka? And it's the Shanka were all around. So Shanka is a plural. It's not a person and it's capitalized. So we know the Shanka are some sort of race, some sort of creature, some sort of monster. And there's a lot of them because they, uh, the Shanka were all around. So now we get a sense that Logan is being pursued. He's being pursued by the Shanka, whoever they are. And there's a lot of them. He's separated from his group. He's separated from his companion, the dog man. He's separated from the, the people he leads um, and he's on his own. He could feel them moving between the trees. His nose was full of the smell of them. And this is something that, you know, I, I've spoken about before. I like it when authors include additional sensory information because in that opening, the bare feet slipping and sliding on the wet earth, the slush, the wet pine needles. That's a lot of texture being added to give you a sense of the feeling as well as implying temperature setting, all of those things. The breath rasping, really nice onomatopoeic sound of the rasping, the blood thumping, again, a tactile sense, as well as conveying the information. And we have all of that in the opening. And then here we have, he could feel them. So that, that feeling of, you know, when you're quiet and you go, someone's watching me, that almost extrasensory perception, we don't really have a way of describing it, but he feels them, he senses them, but it's not clear that he could see them or hear them. He just knows they're there. And then his nose was full of the smell of them. So adding in that additional sensory perception that gives us this more three-dimensional feeling to the world that this is not just something visual. Sounded as if there was some shouting somewhere on his left, fighting maybe. And now we get a further sound added. And what we have here, fighting maybe. So Logan is not sure. This is tied into his perception. We get this close third person, uh, third person focalization. And it's all tied into what he knows, what he sees, what he perceives, and he is unsure. And we have seen that in where he said he was, he was sure, fighting maybe, all of those little things tying together to convey the sense of the character's thoughts and feelings. Um, and it's done so, so quietly, so subtly that it's just added in and you, when you're reading it, you just experience it. You pick up on this. You know what Logan is feeling. Logan crept slowly to his feet, trying to stay quiet. So, crept slowly. Now, crept slowly 
you could say, oh, um, that's actually moving forward. But he crept slowly to his feet. He got up slowly. It's what Abercrombie clearly meant. But because he uses the term crept, we get this sense of the quietness of trying to be stealthy, where he is trying to stay quiet. That's what we use creeping for, the stealthy movement. So he's applied it to the act of getting up. And you go, but that's not how that word should be used. And you go, yes, it's literature. It's not a factual report. Artistic license, using words in ways you don't necessarily always expect to create tone, to create a flavor, to create a specific style or technique. A twig snapped and he whipped around. So the snapping, again, nice onomatopoeic sound, but that sudden sharpness of a snap, and he whipped round. So the sharpness of the snap, the immediate quick reaction that matches that. So you have this wonderful pairing of an external sound leading to the point of view character doing something that mimics it. There was a spear coming at him, a cruel looking spear coming at him fast with a shank on the other end of it. So we get that there's a spear coming at me. So there was a spear coming at him, this sense of, oh my God, he heard the snap, he's whipped round, and there's a spear coming at him. That's the first thing that he notices, big spear, a cruel looking spear. So in this perception, <laughs> he's seen a spear coming at him and his brain is now going, it's actually quite a cruel looking spear, which gives you, uh, gives you a sense of who the Shanka are because it's now applying a cruelness not only to the weapon, but the weapon used by the Shanka, which then means that we are now seeing the Shanka as cruel. And it's a nice way of connecting them without being really obvious about it. Coming at him fast with a Shanka on the other end of it. So he could have been very pedestrian, prosaic and mundane and said, a Shanka was charging him with a cruel looking spear. And you go, that's boring. This is actually an interesting sentence construction which gives you a sense of the action happening. But also if we start thinking about things because this is focalized through Logan, as he turns around, the first thing he notices is the spear. He notices the threat. And then he notices the Shanka behind the spear. But the first thing he focuses on is the weapon. The threat, the direct threat to him is the point of the spear. First thing he notices, which gives you this insight into who Logan is as a character. He's identifying the threat. He's identifying the first thing that he notices and then gives us the additional information. So it actually helps tie this entire perspective in even closer to Logan's perception. Shit, said Logan. Uh, and here we have, so he swears because that's a very natural reaction to seeing a spear coming at you. So. If we, we think about it in terms of what Abercrombie is doing, someone just yells an expletive. It's perfectly normal, perfectly natural. So this is very verisimilitudinous, but also it because it's an expletive, uh, this is giving us tone of the work. It's giving us an insight into Logan that this is someone who swears he's not going to go, oh, blast. It's, you know, visceral reaction. He threw himself to one side, slipped and fell on his face, rolled away, thrashing through the brush, expecting the spear through his back at any moment. So like the very opening, we've gone back to this long sentence of a lot of stuff is happening in a very short space of time because this is one sentence containing all of these actions. He throws himself to one side to avoid the spear. You don't need to avoid the spear put in to understand that we're extrapolating from the previous information. He threw himself to one side. So he throws himself to the side to avoid the spear, slipped and fell on his face. Here is a guy who is running through the forest with no socks or shoes on, who has already slipped and fallen because he's in a headlong panic. And now he's slipped and fallen on his face again. This is not a noble paragon of virtue. Some knight going, oh yes, I will face these foes. and. This is giving us a real sense of the frenetic, frantic action. And this is a flawed human being. 
this is not some narrative construct where he's going to fire off one arrow and it's a million to one shot and it's going to happen nine times out of ten. This this is a very realistic. Um, well, and you know, I don't like using the term realistic. I prefer verisimilitudinous. Uh, this is a very verisimilitudinous situation. Expecting the spear through his back at any moment. So he's thrashing through the brush. He'd fallen on his face. He had thrown himself to the side all in one moment. And while this is going on, he is expecting the spear to come through him. So we get a sense of the closeness of the shanka, the closeness of the spear the closeness of the threat. He scrambled up, breathing hard. Again, this is physical exertion. And he is scrambling. This is not delicate or acrobatic. This is hard fought physical. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the first season of Daredevil, but in uh, Marvel's Daredevil, when he is fighting people, like he, he pauses to start breathing because he this is exhausting and that's what we're getting a sense of here that this this is very verisimilitudinous that this is exertion that is taking it out of him he's not some superhuman he's a normal character he saw the bright point poking at him again dodged out of the way slithered behind a big tree trunk so now the cruel spear has been given the bright point. We know he's in a shadowy forest, so this gives you the, the, the idea of that glint of light coming off the spear point, which again draws attention to the dangerous part of the spear, and also gives us a nice counterpoint to the shadow, to the darkness that's been going on before. He dodged out of the way, slithered behind a big tree trunk. Now, does Abercrombie mean he actually slithered? Like, was he lying on his belly and then was wriggling like a snake? No, but it gives you that sense of that movement as he is going. So again, using a slightly poetic language to convey different tones and a, a different sense to the movement. So this is not, while it is to be read literally that, yes, he went behind a tree trunk, the word slithered is that sh uh, shimmy motion that he's doing to try and get out of so he dodged and then shimmied sort of behind a tree trunk to put an object between him and the guy trying to stab him he showed himself on the other side just for a moment then ducked away jumped round the tree and swung the axe down roaring loud as he could and here we have that classic thing that we see all the time is like i'm going to go round this tree trunk and Oh, look, I'm here. No, I'm going to double back and hit you as you go around that way. It, it's a childish trick. But clearly, Logan thinks it's going to work. And it does. So, from this, there's a headlong pursuit of him. This Shanka is not thinking clearly because someone going around a tree trunk and it's, he sees him just on the other side. So, he immediately commits to an action rather than taking that split second to evaluate and go, no, no, he might just double back and come back around the tree trunk again, because I'm not a five-year-old and I know how this works. So this is actually implying a lot about the level of intelligence of the Shanka, which is actually quite cool that this very simple, innocent trick works. But again, we have that long sentence he showed himself on the other side just for a moment, then ducked away, jumped round the tree and swung the axe down, roaring loud as he could. A lot contained in one sentence, which is conveying, there, there are different ways of conveying pace. One is to use lots of short sentences. So, you know, it's, it's quite frenetic. The other way is to have this sentence that is full of movement and action. One thing following on from another, all within one sentence, giving it a breathlessness a breathless pace because there's so much contained. There was a crack as the blade buried itself deep in the Shanka's skull. So that visceral, violent crack, the blade buried itself deep in the Shanka's skull. So this isn't, he just hit him on the head. There is a thunk. There's this cracking noise. This is 
really uh, visceral, violent, but without being graphic and gruesome. But it's a way of conveying that violence, that sharpness, the, the quickness of the blow and the power behind it. Lucky that. But then Logan reckoned he was due a little luck. And here we have this, this little moment. So lucky that. But then Logan reckoned he was due a little luck. So the narrator is giving us a direct insight into what Logan is thinking. And it's a slightly dry aside that Logan actually seems to have a bit of a sense of humor. It's, oh, that was lucky. Well, I'm kind of due a bit of luck. It's this nice moment of um, contemplation worked into what has been so breathless, so action-packed, that we get this one sentence that remarks that, yes, this was a stupid trick. I'm really lucky it worked. It shouldn't have worked which adds humor, dry, wry humor to this whole thing. The flathead stood there, blinking at him. Then it started to sway from side to side, blood dribbling down its face. And I really, really like this. So up until now, we've, we've been given the Shanka. Uh, he was surrounded by Shanka. And here we have the flathead. So clearly it's referring to exactly the same thing. And it's referred to as an it, so not the same race or uh, species as Logan. Um, and I suppose we can, uh, at this kind of stage, you assume as a human reader that the character you are reading is human. So we get a sense that Shanka are not human, referred to as it. So it's uh, othering, making them monstrous, but also... Logan now uses a different term, the flathead. This is obviously a pejorative derogatory term, which means they are not held in high regard. So when that is combined with it, we get a sense of the monstrous other rather than Shanko referring to another tribe of humans or another type of human or another race of human. There's an implication that it's actually a different type of creature. And flathead gives us this sort of strange sense of uh, starting to picture what is going on because Logan hasn't had a moment yet to actually talk about these creatures and describe them visually because everything has been so frenetic and referring to the Shanka as flatheads because this is the second time it's happened. Uh, he peered out and the flathead hissed and stabbed at him. So we know that the shank and the flathead are the same thing. We know this is an informal derogatory pejorative term. And so it suggests a lot just by using these little fantasy terms worked in and making it very clear to the reader that it's referring to the same thing. It conveys so much about Logan's attitude to the Shanka as enemies. They are not on the same level as him. They are something to be derided. They are something to be regarded as uh, in a derogatory fashion. They are dismissed. But clearly, he's not prepared. He's running through the forest in his bare feet. So he's at a disadvantage. So there is a threat. All of this conveyed so very simply. The flathead stood there blinking at him. And we get this wonderful sense of, you know, it's gone thunk. He's gotten an axe to the head. And this thing, this shanka, this flathead, has that blinking after being hit in the head, clearly dead, but doesn't know it yet, if you remember that expression from things. Then it started to sway from side to side, blood dribbling down its face. Then it dropped like a stone, dragging the axe from Logan's fingers. So here we have that you know, very direct um, standard simile of dropped like a stone. Dragging the axe from Logan's fingers, thrashing around on the ground at his feet. So again, using these slightly extended sentences to show all of this is connected, all of this is happening in a short space of time. And this is obviously not good for Logan. We know he has an ax. We don't know if he has any other weapons. And now his ax has just been ripped from his hands after burying it in the flathead, the Shanka's skull. 
He tried to grab hold of his axe handle, but the shanka still somehow had a grip on its spear and the point was flailing around in the air. So we have this sense, this creature is dying. It has suffered a mortal wound, but it's doing the death throes. And because it's flailing around, Logan can't get to his weapon. And it's clear that all of this has to happen very, very quickly. We knew there were Shanka pursuing him. They were all around. There's more than one enemy. And he needs a weapon. And his weapon is now stuck in the head of something that's fallen on the ground, and he can't get to it because even though this creature is dying, it is unconsciously waving, uncontrollably waving around its spear as it dies, and Logan could take an injury. He fears taking an injury, which again implies that Logan is not some grand immortal, that he's not some uh, powerful, magical being, that he is actually human. And getting a bad cut from a spear is going to have consequences. So violence in this world has consequences. Again, and this is, we're only a couple of paragraphs into the prologue and we're already getting a sense of the world building, a sense of the tone, a sense of the narrator's slightly wry sense of humor, all of this being conveyed. Gah, squawked Logan as the spear cut a nick in his arm. So obviously, gah, like an, an exclamation um, denoting pain, but squawked Logan, this is, this is not a noble description. This is not a heroic description. He squawked. This is giving you a real sense that Logan is not, again, some paragon of virtue, some knightly paladin, anything like this. He squawked. This doesn't typically happen to heroes. Um, and the spear cut a nick in his arm. So we know it's not a very serious wound because it's only a nick but even with a small cut he experiences pain squawks and and lets out a, a an exclamation so he's very human we know he's not incapacitated because it's just a nick but it's not one of those ones uh, if you remember from like the, the bad 80s movies where someone gets shot and they look down and they go huh just a flesh wound he's not shrugging it off he's going yeah that actually hurt <laughs> i didn't like that But squawking is undercutting the heroic nature of the character. So there is a, a real sense that he is not a hero. Or at the very least, I mean, this is the beginning of the book. He's not a hero yet. Um, he felt a shadow fall across his face. And this is another beautiful little technique. Uh, when you're out and someone walks between you and the sun, you do feel it, even if you, you can't see them because it, that change in temperature. So here we have something that's very visual, a shadow fall across his face, but it's relayed to us in terms of the feeling of that temperature shift, the feeling of that change. And it's just a nice way of doing that. Another flathead, a damn big one. So look at how we've transitioned to these much shorter sentences. He squawks. He felt a shadow fall across his face. Another flathead. A damn big one. Already in the air, arms outstretched. No time to get the axe. No time to get out of the way. Logan's mouth opened, but there was no time to say anything. What do you say at a time like that? So we've gone from this external description that uh, where the structure was all of these things happening in, in single sentences, but with a lot of parts, to these much shorter sentences, um, which is bringing us much closer in to Logan's psyche. And so we get almost the processing of what he is thinking. He feels a shadow across his face, another flathead, a damn big one. Again, swearing, so uh, giving you that sense of uh, grittiness, a man, a man of the people, um, already in the air, arms outstretched. So this is all, he senses a shadow, looks round, identifies it's a flathead, identifies the size of the threat, sees that it's already moving towards him, goes, do I have time to get the axe? No, I don't have time to get the axe. There's no time to dodge out of the way. 
And so the only thing that he has done in this split second is Logan's mouth opened, but there was no time to say anything. And so we just have, we can picture this so vividly of someone just looking up and going, and that's it. That, that's the moment that we have. All of this has happened in that tiny fraction of a second. And what do you say at a time like that? Now, technically, this is changing the perspective. If this was meant to be Logan's internal thoughts, uh, word for word, usually they would be in italics and they would be framed in, he wouldn't do it as, what do you say at a time like that? Um, it, it would be framed more in the first person. And so this looks like a breaking of the narrative perspective that we've moved from an external into a much more internal perspective. But this is actually, what do you say at a time like that? This has this wonderful tone of the narrator. The narrator has a sense of humor and is drawing attention to like, he opened his mouth, but didn't say anything. Like, and what would you say in a moment like this? Like, honestly. And so I think from, if you were doing a very uh, superficial reading of this and go, well, the, the rules are you pick a perspective and you stick with it. This is technically breaking that perspective, but it gives you a tone to the narration. It is a stylistic choice and it's very, very deliberate. And I think very effective because we now have a sense of what the narrator can do. Yes, third person focalization, but at least partially omniscient and almost breaking the, the fourth wall that this narrator knows that this is a story and it's very knowing the wry, dry sense of humor uh, and quite a dark sense of humor. And I think we have to pick up on that because, I, and this is, you know, with hindsight, one of those things that uh, if someone had just given you this manuscript to look at, you might highlight it and go, you've changed perspective here. Like you, you've shifted and you're now doing something, blah, blah, blah. But remember, this is a published novel. So an author has written it. It's gone to an agent. The agents looked at it. The agent sent it to a publishing house where an editor has looked at it. But it's gone through this entire process. It's then gone through a copy editor. It's then been printed up. So something like this that you would or could presume is, oh, this is a terrible mistake. This should never happen. This is a breaking of the writing rules. Like the comedian that I was talking about at the very start, this is technically breaking a rule of holding to one perspective, but it's done for an effect and it's not a mistake. This is done very deliberately. And this gets into this whole argument about authorial intent. The author intended this. We know we can almost certainly know that the author intended this, that this wasn't a mistake because it has gone through an entire publishing process. But yes, identifying that this is a shift in perspective that is not necessarily signaled that much to this point, this shift to what do you say at a time like that, this rhetorical question, that is humorous. And you go, okay, there's a humorous line here, but it's not following the rules. My interpretation of this it would be, this is deliberate and it works brilliantly because it adds humor to what is happening in a dark action sequence. And it's telling you a lot about the tone of the book and saying that, well, third person focalization has to be X or omniscient. You go, what about semi-omniscient? What about someone who likes to, to move between the two? Why are they not valid choices? You go, well, there's no real reason why they're not valid choices. It's just that that's not what the rule is. And if someone was to write and constantly slip between them without realizing that they were slipping between them, that would be a problem in a text. But someone who does it very knowingly and knows it's creating that effect, that's breaking the rule for a purpose. And that's how I would interpret that line, that shift of perspective, that shift in the narration, um, the dipping in to Logan's head to give us his thoughts, but then almost turning to the reader and addressing the reader and go, what do you say at a time like that? It's implying this sense of humor. They crash to the wet ground together. 
And again, adding that additional tactile sense, wet ground, that one extra word there just gives the description that bit more depth, that bit more feeling to make it more verisimilitudinous, to make it more immersive. Roll together through the dirt and the thorns and the broken branches. And so, again, going back to that um, sense of pace, uh, uh, frantic and frenetic movement, but the dirt, the thorns and the broken branches tearing and punching and growling at each other. So this is animalistic, bestial. This is not noble combat. This is, this is not honorable combat. This is a fight to the death and it is ungainly. It is brutal. It is two animals fighting, uh, bare teeth and nails and claws. Th this is not one of those beautiful duels that gets described as, oh, yes, and he was on guard and then used that sword form and blah, blah, blah. You know, this is visceral, um, very down to earth, very gritty. A tree root hit Logan in the head hard and made his ears ring. And again, going back to this sense that this is a real world. The number of times in, in films and in books, you know, people roll down hillsides and then they just stand up and everything's fine. Like none of them get a concussion. None of them accidentally bang their head on a rock. None of them get a, a tree root stuck into the side of them as they are going down. That causes like a serious injury. Here, we, we get a sense that yes, this is a real world and real injuries can happen outside of, you know, an actual combat or narrative reason. That here, interacting with the world can injure you. You will get scratched by thorns. Broken branches will stab into you and cause bruising. A tree root hit Logan in the head hard. And again, here we have this whole thing. A tree root cannot hit someone because a tree root can't move. Well, unless it's an ant. But a tree root can't move. So Logan hit the tree root, but because we're with Logan's uh, point of view, think about it from that, that Logan is assuming he is the center and then these things are coming towards him rather than if it was an external view and it's Logan rolling down a hill. Um, so Logan rolling down a hill, Logan would hit the tree root, but here a tree root hit Logan. So it's giving us that close in vocalization from Logan's perspective, because from Logan's perspective, this tree root came out of nowhere and hit him, even though it's stationary. So it's just, it's a beautiful, concise, short, brilliant way to convey that closeness of the point of view of Logan. They rolled on and on downhill, the world flipping and flipping around, Logan trying to shake the fuzz out of his head and throttle the big flathead at the same time. Oh, I missed a bit. He had a knife somewhere, but he couldn't remember where. So the tree root hit Logan, his ears are ringing, he is disoriented. You get that ringing in your ears when you've had a bad clout to the head. He had a knife somewhere, so we do know he now has, he, he has a second weapon but he's just been smacked in the head. This has all happened so quickly. He, he can't remember in the moment where things are. Have you ever been panicked and gone? You can't think straight. This is conveying all of that, that very human reaction. He's been hit in the head. He's in the middle of a fight to the death where if he goes, oh, hang on, can we just stop for a second? I, um, I know I have a knife here somewhere. Just, just, just give me a moment. That's not how the real world works. That's not how this world works. Uh, they rolled on and on downhill, the world flipping and flipping around, Logan trying to shake the fuzz out of his head and throttle the big flat head at the same time. We've moved back into that longer sentence structure with all of these sub clauses, giving a sense of everything happening all at once in one sentence. And again, the world flipping and flipping around. Does the world flip around? Well, it rotates, but uh, no, clearly this is from Logan's perspective. Logan is the one rolling. But again, it gives you that sense of the disorientation that Logan is experiencing. And so it's, it's nicely done. And he's trying to throttle the big flathead at the same time. 
So again, this is not, this is just happening. And then this other thing is going to happen. All of these actions are combined. He's still in the fight. He is still fighting while this thing is happening, rolling down the hill and while being hit on the head and trying to remember where his knife is and trying to stop the flathead killing him. It's a lot going on at once. There was no stopping. So he can't take the time to stop himself. He can't stop the flathead from attacking him. He can't stop and step out of this action to find the uh, the knife. He can't stop the ringing in his ears. There was no stopping. It's not attributed just to the rolling. It's giving you a sense of it being connected to all of this, that this has a pace and an action all of its own that he is not in control of. So again, emphasizing that lack of control that Logan has had from the very beginning because he's running barefoot through a forest in the snowy slush. It had seemed a clever notion to pitch a camp near the gorge. And this is where the reader has that, uh-oh moment. Logan's rolling downhill and now we know he's near a gorge. So from this, there's a real issue that Logan may roll off a cliff. And how do we know that this is being signaled? It seemed a clever notion to pitch camp near the gorge. So at the time, it seemed smart. But is being implied here. But now this was not clever. This was not a smart thing to do. The implication that what seemed like a good idea at the time actually has turned out not to be a good idea. That is all being implied. So again, extrapolating from incomplete information to get the sense. And also, it had seemed a clever notion. We are getting that wry sense of humor again because it's almost smirking at you. It seemed like a good idea to do this. Not a good idea anymore. No chance of anyone sneaking up behind. So from, from a tactical sense, yes, if there's a gorge behind you, it's going to be very difficult for someone to sneak up from behind you because there's a big gorge. There's a, a cliff face. Your one side is protected. You only have to guard three sides. That seems brilliant. Why is it not a good idea here? Because he's rolling down towards the cliff. Now, as Logan slid over the edge of the cliff on his belly, the idea lost much of its appeal. This wonderful, understated sense of humor evaluating the previous choice and going, ah, shit. <laughs> this is funny. The, the sense of humor worked in here is just so subtly done and nicely done. He slid over the edge of the cliff on his belly. So we have that inexorable slide, that grinding of the, the little pebbles and rocks, that screeching or scraping noise. And he's on his belly. His hands scrabbled at the wet earth. So again, that frantic, desperate motion, scrabbling, desperately trying to grab onto something. And the wet earth, again, a tactile sense. It's dirt. It's mud. It's, it's not nice. We're not going with the fragrant loam, the rich topsoil. No, it's the wet earth. Very bland, very prosaic, very down to earth, very straightforward prose. Which, if this is how Logan is describing it, if we're linked so closely to his psyche, again, is giving you an idea about his level of education, his way of looking at the world. He's not using poetic, fancy terms for things. They're very natural terms. Even when he talked about slithering, natural term, it's associated with a snake. Um, only dirt and brown pine uh, and brown pine needles. So we can really visualize this uh, of that sort of coniferous forest, the pine needles everywhere that are that yellowish brown, they're prickly, they stick into you, they're not pleasant. Um, and he's sliding through them and trying to grab onto something. His fingers clutched, clutched at nothing. So his fingers clutched. So again, that desperate, linking to scrabbling, but the nice repetition, his fingers clutched, clutched at nothing. 
he was beginning to fall. He let go a little whimper. So we had him squawking. We have him whimpering. He, again, we get a real sense of who Logan is as a character just from these little tiny words that are signaling to us as a reader what is going on. His hands closed around something, a tree root sticking out from the earth at the very edge of the gorge. Again, think of how close we are to his perspective. As he's scrabbling, as he's clutching, suddenly it grabs something. And it's the tactile sensation first, because that's the action first, and then it is followed by an identification of the action. So it's an identification of, what did I just grab hold of? Oh, it's a tree root. And it's sticking out from the earth at the very edge of the gorge. So we are tied into how he is thinking, how he is processing information, uh, how he is perceiving the world. He swung in space, gasping, but his grip was firm. <clears throat> Apologies. So he swung in space. So you have that. He has just slid off the edge. He's falling down, and it's that still, that motion is still ongoing, but he is now firmly gripped onto a tree root. He is not going to fall straight away. Um, and if you think like in Mission Impossible or any of those action movies, this is that. Uh, very clear dramatic scene of you know the sliding off the edge and then grabbing onto something it's very visual very cinematic um is it realistic well you have to be in incredibly good shape to be able to hang on uh, stop your descent with only one arm and hang there with one arm but obviously free climbers do it all the time so it is physically possible ha he shouted ha he was still alive his immediate reaction. So he's just grabbed this, he swung down, and it's, yes, I'm still alive. He hasn't even processed anything yet. It is that immediate visceral reaction and celebration of life. This, I think, ties into, um, yeah, he has a living in the moment kind of attitude. He is not uh, some contemplative, strategic genius. It would take more than a few flatheads to put an end to Logan Nine Fingers. So now we get his full name, Logan Nine Fingers. So I'm assuming human missing a finger. <laughs> but it, it, it consolidates that impression of the, the fantasy realm of someone having like the cool name that they've earned over time. And it's, he's thought about himself in the third person. He's a character. It would take more than a few flatheads to put an end to Logan Ninefingers. This is a narrative. The narrator is having a bit of fun here. But again, it's what Logan's thinking. And he, he's thought about himself in the third person, which may be a bit odd. It's interesting. We get the additional information. Um, and I'd be curious to see what develops of this. He started to pull himself up onto the bank, but couldn't manage it. There was some great weight around his legs. He peered down. And I love this moment. He's grabbed on. He's going, yes, I'm alive. And he's going to try and pull himself up. Because remember, he's still basically swinging. He swung out into space. And this is all happening so quickly. And he's only had time to go, ha, ha. And he's suffering a concussion. He hit his head. He's not thinking clearly. And he goes, all right, just put, hang on a second. I'm heavier than I should be. There's a weight around my legs. So you think all of this is happening so quickly. He hasn't even had a chance to put his second hand up. He's starting to pull himself up like that so he can get his second hand up. He peered down. Full stop. And then there's this paragraph break. The gorge was deep, very deep with sheer rocky sides. So as he's looking down, you can imagine if you're hanging off a cliff edge and you start looking down, the first thing that you notice as your eye tracks down is you go, I'm up very high. The ground is down very, very low. We are tracking his eye line as he looks down. Here and there, a tree clung to a crack, growing out into the empty air, spreading its leaves into space. 
So as he is looking down, what he is noticing as he's looking down is, I'm on a cliff. It's very, very far down. And there's the occasional tree sticking out into nowhere. The emphasis of how high up he is, that there's nothing around to grab onto, that all there are these little solitary plants. He is noting all of this as he looks down. Again, identifying things in the order he's coming to them, exactly as he did with seeing the spear, uh, then seeing the shanka behind it. That we are so tightly uh, bound to how he sees and how he's tracking. This is wonderfully consistent and really well done. The river hissed away far below, fast and angry, foaming white water fringed by jagged black stone. So again, as he's tracking down, as he's looking down to try and find out what this weight is, so far away, he can see a river. And it's very far below. Again, emphasizing the height. It's fast and angry, which describes the river, but also has been describing everything that we've been uh, witnessing thus far. It's a nice, consistent tying into this. Foaming white water fringed by jagged black stone. That wonderful contrast of, contrast of the white and the black. This is why it's sticking out to him as he is tracking his eyes down to find out why he is so heavy. That the white and black immediately draws the attention that he can see this uh, rushing violent river. That was all bad for sure. But the real problem was closer to hand. And now we get to, he's noticed in the, this very short space of time of falling off, grabbing hold, yelling out an exclamation, I'm still alive, going to grab something and then going, I'm too heavy, starting to look down. And now he realizes what the problem is. And again, it's presented with a wry, dry sense of humor. That was all bad, for sure. You know, you're hanging off a cliff. There's space all around you. There's a river that's down below you. And it's not a nice, deep, placid, let's go for a, a dip with our friends kind of river. It's a violent river full of rocks and fast moving water. And it's not nice. All of this is bad. You're in a really bad situation. But do you want to know the worst of it? The worst of it is yet to come because... The big Shanka was still with him, swinging gently back and forth with its dirty hands clamped tight around his left ankle. The humor here, the dark humor of he slid off, he's grabbed this thing, he's, oh, and remember, he was still moving, he was still swinging. The Shanka is still swinging. It's not like they've been hanging there for about 10 minutes and go, oh, right, hang on, there's, there's something on my leg. This has all happened so quickly that the Shanka is still swinging from falling off that he could have actually been at the height of a swing, therefore technically weightless for a short second. And then as he has come back down, is putting more weight on, which is why Logan has suddenly felt that I'm much heavier than I should be. And it's the big Shanka, so we know it's the same one that he was fighting. Swinging gently back and forth. This incongruous language of this, this big monster apparently attached to it, swinging gently backwards and forwards. The humor here, uh, it, it's just so nicely done with its dirty hands clamped tight about his left ankle. Now, literally, obviously, they have been rolling around in the dirt. But get your hands off me, you damn dirty ape. It's, a again, this aspect of pejorative description of the Shanka, that implication. Yes, its hands are probably dirty. Uh, they've been rolling around in the dirt. Logan's been grabbing at things. It's probably been grabbing at things. They're probably filthy. They're probably covered in wet mud and slush and pine needles, but it's dirty hands. Again, we're tied into Logan's psyche. So this is all about his perception of the Shanka. So I hope you've enjoyed that first part. I will go on to talk about the, the sort of second half of the, the prologue. I like leaving it on a cliffhanger. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. Sorry. But 
part of what I wanted to show with this is if you were looking at a style guide of how to write, how to write creatively, the rules of creative writing, you can see that Abercrombie's broken a whole load of them here. Like he, he's not writing to that pattern, to that accepted way of writing. And yet, because of that, because he's done these things so knowingly, so intentionally, you can see how he is developing his own style, how he is emphasizing a tone and a humor to the, to the narrator that he, yes, is using close third person focalization, but has that slight omniscience to the narrator to give us that additional experience. Because narrative, after all, is not recorded history. It's an art, it's a story. These are all ways of creating story effects. And if we just identified, this is the technique, this is a different technique, this, these two should not go together, this is bad, we're missing the point of you identify a technique and then you evaluate what effect it has instead of going, this is not the technique they should use. We do this all the time because we have certain expectations when we read narrative and that's based on our own experience. It's based on what we think narrative should do. It's based on what we think a book or a story should do. It's based on how many different stories we've read, the different types of literature that we've read, the different story types, narrative types, styles, approaches that we have experienced and have knowledge of. All of these feed into how we understand text, but also our expectations about what a text does or should do. And when we start thinking in terms of a text should do something, we begin being prescriptive when I think a, a lot of times it's actually more rewarding to be slightly more analytical and go, this is what's happening. Because you can see, I get so much enjoyment out of finding out how Abercrombie has, is creating these effects. And it gives you this understanding of what's going on on the page. But I don't prejudge it. I don't look at it and go, oh, that's not the effect that I would use, or it shouldn't be done that way. I look at it, I identify it. And I try to figure out what effect it's having. So I hope this has been fun. Uh, it's been fun for me, at least. Thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next one.